Women to Watch an intimate look into the lives of prominent and influential women leaders from around the world and the challenges they faced on their journey. It's the real story behind her title. Join us every week to hear more stories about women from around the world and in your own communities at womentowatch.net. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. And the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC <laughs> Philadelphia and start streaming today. Welcome back to another week of Women to Watch. I'm Sue Rocco. So great to be here this week. And we have a great show for you today. Joining me in just a moment will be Edvish Robinson. Edvish is Senior Vice President of Network Engineering and Operations uh, for T-Mobile. So we're going to be talking about technology, but um, Edvish has such an incredible life story, um, and she's doing a lot of work to help young girls uh, and women out there in the STEM field. So I'm very honored to have her. As always, you'll hear from our watch team of corporate partners, uh, Sherry Marson will be with Jennifer Lynn, an award-winning journalist and author. Uh, you'll hear from Madeline Bell, CEO of Children's Hospital, and also Carol Eggert for our Military Watch from Comcast NBC Universal. So now I'm very excited to welcome to the show Edvish Robinson. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, Suzanne. I'm super excited to be here. It's so great to have you, Advish. I know you and I connected a, a quite a while ago, um, and I've been looking forward to this, having done my homework on you and 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 listening to quite a number of your um, talks and uh, interviews that you've done in the past. I just think you're you're such an inspiration for for many reasons, and one obviously is because of your beginning. And um, I know that you're from the Ivory Coast in Africa. Um, you came from very humble beginnings. Um, and, and I think even just the note of having to walk to school every day as a little girl um, is quite different from the lives of children here in the United States. Um, I, my first question for you is how old were you? Do you remember when you made the decision, I'm going to have a different life and I'm going to create it to help myself and my family. How old were you? I would say probably eight or nine. So first, thank you for having me. I grew up in Ivory Coast, it was a beautiful country in West Africa. And uh, the city that I actually grew up was called Ababo, which is a very poor city in uh, the capital. And indeed, many, many young girls like me, is a privilege to be going to school because usually the boys are selected to go to school. So as a young girl, I was going to, you know, I was raised by my grandparents and the school was very far away. So you have to walk every day. You didn't have the privilege to have free lunches that we have here in the United States, but you will pack your lunch, you will pack whatever it was cooked and then you go to school and um, you take advantage of whatever is given to you. But uh, grow, growing up with my grandparents, I've learned that faith and courage and perseverance was the thing that I had to always wrap around myself. So early on, I decided that um, not I would not be the victim. I would not, you know, the why me kind of like mindset, but just embrace what I had and enjoy the little thing that we have. And then wrap that around me in order for me to change the mindset and change my life and the life of people around me. Mm. Um, tell me about your relationship with your grandfather. Uh, so I, um, my parent had me when I was very young and I was raised by my grandfather and my grandmother. We didn't have much, but the love that they gave me was so unconditional. And to this day, the biggest gift that my grandfather gave me at a very young age was my belief in Christ. So as a very young age, I, I knew, you know, I knew I knew how to develop a relationship with Christ. And my grandfather used to tell me before, every time that we were joking around, say, Vivi, which is my nickname for Edvige, remember your first husband is your education. Your first husband is your degree. So whatever you do, make sure that you get your degree so that you are not you are not anybody wife or anybody, you, you stand on your own. 
So that was bolded and imprinted in my mind. Mm -hmm. And so as a child, since I was eight years old, I knew that regardless of what's going on, I was going to go to school, finish my degree, and then that would change my trajectory and my trajectory actually for the rest of my life. And that's what I exactly did. Did you, you know, educationally, did you excel in math and science and, and that STEM field? Actually, in, in the other course growing up, there wasn't a specific STEM field. It was just like getting straight A's in all my classes. I love finance. My initial degree was actually in finance because I wanted to become a banker. And I actually entered the tech field when I came here in the United States, when I, you know, I was starting to look for different opportunities to make a little bit of money so that I can send it back home. So if, you, if you're familiar with people that come from Africa, you're not only working for yourself. You're not only going to school for yourself. You're going for yourself, for your family, for a village. There's a lot of generation. Everybody's counting on you for you to succeed. So tech was a field that I wanted to you know, enter because I was hearing that it, that it was easier to make a little bit more money. So I entered the tech field by accident. You know, I stumbled into it. I wasn't, I, I wasn't expected to become, uh, you know, so magnetic toward tech. So I entered by accident. Do you feel, when you look at yourself today, do you feel as though you are where you were meant to be? Absolutely. Absolutely. All the learning. I remember, uh, I mean, when I started in the tech field, I was the only female in the assembly line in working the graveyard shift. And at the time, it was really, really difficult because I was only female, only uh, foreign person there. So it was hard. But now when I look back on my trajectory, all the difficulty, all the learning, all the people that got put on my path as mentors and people that was willing to give me a chance to, to do different work and all the questions I was asking in order for me to become better, all the learning, and now propel me to where I am today. So I want to advise, but that's actually maybe helpful for anybody listening. All your small beginning, all those turn and small turn and, and stop, all those things work out for your best. All those things work out to get you to where you're supposed to be. No, don't, don't dismiss them. Is there some, if I were to ask you who was um, someone who believed in you growing up, other than your grandparents, is there somebody that comes to mind? Was there a teacher? Uh, someone in your community? Not, not the teacher, but I would say my aunt. My aunt is uh, my father on my father's side. Her name is Aunt Sabine. And she was the one, I mean, actually quick funny story. When I was growing up, I used to stutter, like terrible stuttering. And my aunt and my grandfather were the one that was basically telling me, one day you're going to be in the news. Look at this. We're in the news today. One day you're going to be in the news. Take your time to speak. Take your time because even stuttering, it will, it will go away. And by the time I, I, I was nine or 10, I started speaking clearly. So I would say my aunt, my aunt was one, somebody that believed in me, that loved me unconditionally. And I believed that I could always try something new. I could always go the extra mile. So between my grandfather and my aunt, I would say those were probably my biggest, uh, my biggest um, champion and cheerleaders. Yeah. What do you think is the difference between someone who comes from a background like you did and can come to the United States, start all over and continually climb that ladder and someone who is not able to get out? What is the difference in the mindset? the belief, the, the confidence, particularly for young girls? Particularly for young girls, I think is early on believing that you are worth the effort, right? So very young, at a very young age, my grandfather, as I mentioned to you, always advised me that you can do this. You, are, you know, he was encouraging me, even though I didn't know I was going to do it. He always encouraged me that there's something better. He always encouraged me to, to aim for something higher, for something better. So I do believe that, you know, the people that you have in your life at the very beginning during your adolescence uh, years, those people really impart in you something that propel you for your future. So, so I would say the difference is like, is to me was the support that I received from my grandparents. And then for me personally is that resilience factor, right? So 
I think it's all in the mindset of you can become a victim to basically say, well, I come from Africa, you know, the difficulties is always hard. Or you can look at it and basically say, I cannot win anyway. I cannot move forward anyway. I cannot push through anyway. Mm. So I, so it's, it's that mindset that you cultivate because then you overcome one thing and then you overcome another thing. So it's a mindset. It's a mind shift. But yeah. it's not by you believing that you are worth the effort. I, you know, everything I know about you, I think you're you're a true optimist. And one of my favorite quotes, you said, um, and this was later when you had been working and, and here in the United States, you said, instead of saying there's no one here that looks like me, you said, what a privilege it is to be here and stand out from everyone else. I think that's such an, a wise perspective. Tell me about that and how you do that continually even today. Well, thank you for mentioning that. Um, as you mentioned earlier at the beginning of the show, I mentor a lot of young girls. I mentor a lot of uh, especially under, under, underrepresented um, people, underrepresented women and men and everything else. And the thing that I hear all the time is I'm the only one. I'm the only one, I'm the only female, I'm the only one, and oh my God, you know, why, we, why cannot change the rule? And I was like, well, if you're only one, guess what? They cannot miss you. You're the only one that look like you, you're the only one that sound like you. So why don't you take it advantage of it? Why don't you use it to your advantage? Mm. So I always embrace that. I always embrace, um, you. I always embrace this attitude of believing that you have everything you need in order for you to be successful. You have it. It's just a matter of, of, you know, of I usually say remove, unleashing it so that you can become everything you are supposed to be. So it is a, it is a mind shift of believing, again, it is a mind shift of believing that first of all, you have everything you, you, you have, I mean, you need. Secondly, you are worth the effort and mostly take advantage of where you are. I love, um, I read somewhere where was, somebody was saying that there's no, uh, there's no snowflake alike. So mm -hmm. imagine that if there's no snowflake alike, I'm glad to be who I am, who I am. Yeah. And it's to really embrace that. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the most powerful messages. I really do. I, especially for young girls who spend a lot of time looking around at what everyone else is doing and trying to mimic. Um, tell me what, so I want to go back. When you first came to the United States, where, who did you live with? Where, where did you go? It's a pretty funny story. I mean, uh, so I, I don't know if everybody understands that there's a program called a diversity visa. It's called the green card. So the green card is a lottery that uh, United States and many other countries have in order to allow underserved uh, community and underserved country to be able to come to United States. So I got my green, I got, I won the green card lottery and watch this out of over, you know, 30 million people that play the lottery, they've selected less than 0.5%. And of the 0.5% that we do every other year, I was, I was so, I can, you know, another way to say that my story is not possible without God. It's like the whole process of it to even be here. And then when you arrive, uh, you actually hosted by a host family. So there's, okay. mi there's multiple family that decide to host um, uh, young people, young students. And, and I was one of them. And the, my host family was in, uh, so funny, but my host family was in Wisconsin, Wisconsin, I mean, in Bethesda, off of 8200 Wisconsin Avenue. To this day, I remember the street address and the apartment, just in case I was getting lost. I have my English dictionary <laughs> with me at the time. So right. that that address is kind of like imprinted in my mind, 8200 Wisconsin Avenue in Bethesda, wow. Maryland. You, yeah. you know, you were thinking that is where I'm going. I don't know where this place is, but 8200 Wisconsin Avenue. And how did you kind of assimilate into the community with all of the people your age? Well, it, it wasn't really people my age. I was, you know, it was a, it was a host family. There were um, people that were working, doing different things. So I, I had to go to, to English classes. So I took ESOL, English as a second language. Then I took the TOEFL which is a test that you need to take in order to go to college to the United States. And then from that point, I have to, you know, I had to go back to school. I have my uh, bank degree, as I mentioned. So I went back to school. So I got my bachelor here in the United States. I got my master here in the United States. 
and I got several uh, key leadership um, programs from Harvard and uh, Wharton. So the majority of my studies took place here in the United States. And I'm assuming there's a m very large difference between education here in the United States and, and in Africa. I want to talk a little bit about that when we come back. We have to go into our first break. Stay with us for our watch team, and we'll be back with Edvish Robinson. Action News, celebrating 50 years of AccuWeather. If you think severe weather has been on the rise, you are correct. In the last three years, tornado warnings in our region have shattered records. With 52 last year alone, half of those warnings resulted in confirmed tornadoes, including two extremely rare EF3s. Thanks for always trusting us to keep you informed. 50 Years of AccuWeather is sponsored by Independence Blue Cross. Choose coverage you can count on with the region's strongest network. Is the best vacation one that you find? or one you get lost in, one that takes you to new heights or reminds you to go with the flow, to get your feet wet and your wheels spinning, one that lets you find your own rhythm or get carried away. Find the best of yourself. Get lost in the woods. Plan your stay in the wild woods today. From Philadelphia to the Lehigh Valley and everywhere in between, for 150 years, Penn Community Bank has been a part of your neighborhood. Helping businesses start, supporting families as they grow, and staying connected to the people and places that make this region special. It's who we are and where we're from. Penn Community Bank, here we are and here we grow. There's a moment, every hour, every day, every week. These moments shape our world. They add color, perspective, and sometimes pain. Moments are meant to be shared, shared by friends, family, people you trust. At Action News, we cherish every moment, and it's our profound responsibility to bring you closer to your world. Never miss a moment. Trust the people at Action News. Do you stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. And the big story on Action News. Plus special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amounts of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Hi, and welcome back to the show. I'm joined this week by Edvish Robinson, Senior Vice President of Network Engineering and Operations with T-Mobile. Um, something else you shared with me in our introductory call that I loved. You said um, in your very first interview, and you'll have to remind me what company that was, um, they told you you were not qualified. And you said, well, that's fine because I'm ready to learn. Um, Again, not allowing a no or a hesitation from somebody to derail you. Um, talk about that and how that has helped you in your career. I love that question. I think it's going to help a lot of people. A no to me is just a, no, a not yet. Right? So just, just if you want, if you, every time you hear a no, it means not yet. It doesn't mean a no forever. And as I mentioned, it was very, very hard when I came in because I was learning the language. I had to go to school, you know, during the day. Then at night, I had to figure out I know how to work so that, as I mentioned, I had to send money back home. But so in order to do that, I also had a family. So you can imagine that my husband used to ask me, when do you sleep? I, I, I don't remember. I remember sleeping in buses, you know, between, between work and between buses in order for me to sustain myself. So when I started, I was a field tech, you know, as of at, at leaving the manufacturing, I became a field tech. And after three years of being a, a field tech in the telecom industry, I wanted to become a manager. So I asked my boss at the time, I was like, I really want to stop being in the field. I'm in the snow and the heat and everything else. I really want to work in the office. And it was like, well, Edvige, do you even know what an ROI means? I was like, I don't know what that is. What is it? <laughs> it's return on investment. You need to be able to speak business. You need to be able to speak different languages. 
you can come and speak all this technology languages on only. If you want to work in the office, you want to become a manager, you need to go back to school. But right now, you're not ready. So I asked him, what it would take for me to be ready? He said, well, you need to have a bachelor. And so I was like, okay. So I, it took me two and a half years, and I went two and a half years working, you know, going working in the morning full time, going to school full time, and taking care of my family full time, all of this. And then I got my bachelor after two and a half years instead of three years. And then I went back to him and basically say, hey, I have my bachelor now. I think I'm ready to come in. And he, he couldn't he couldn't refuse it. So he gave him the he gave him the shot. Wow. And what company was that? That was back then with uh, Clearwire. And okay. Uh, Okay. So by the way, you're a mother of four boys, correct? That's right. Um, which is a whole other, you know, responsibility. Um, when we talk on the show often about the role of mother, which is an incredibly, um, I would say, consuming emotionally part of our lives. We're always thinking about them and, and making sure and hoping they're okay. Um, and then the responsibility, you know, in a C-suite of a company like T-Mobile, what works for you um, on a day-to-day -day that allows you to kind of separate the two and be able to focus on either one fully? Well, one thing that I like to share with people, and maybe that will help someone, is there's no work balance or anything to that nature. It's just prioritization. So when I'm in the office, I focus on the work that I need to do 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And when I'm at home, I turn off my phone and I focus on my family. So it's about prioritizing your day and prioritizing activities that you need to do. One thing for sure, and then don't, you know, I don't want anybody to get it twisted. Anything worth having requires sacrifice. So for many, many years, I, I miss my kids' games. I miss a lot of activities for my kids. I couldn't be at parent, you know, a parent meeting. My husband has to go. And but you you have to do certain things for the betterment of your family. You have to do certain things for the betterment of your kid. I have four young men, and one of my why is to ensure that they get a chance to go to high village colleges and university and they get the best chance in order for them to compete in this world. So in order for me to do that, I need to make sure that I'm financially stable to offer them that uh, opportunity. Mm. So in order for us to do that, guess what? It required a sacrifice upfront. So it's, for me, it has been really the prioritization of my time, the focus with my family, and more importantly, always reminding myself of my wives. I would imagine as well that you're a beautiful example to your boys of a strong woman female um, that is successful and, and doing great things outside of your role with T-Mobile. I know that you're very um, supportive of, of women's and girls initiatives and, and mentoring when and where you can. Tell me what some of that work um, means to you and where you're doing that. It's all, for me, it's all about paying it forward because somebody many, many years ago was, was willing to stop and teach me something. And to me, that's my legacy because I want all those young girls to see me and see that it's possible. I want them to be able to talk to me and get to learning now so that they can avoid some of the mistakes I've, I've made along my journey. So if we can equip the uh, next generation sooner, instead of waiting for them to start um, the journey at work and then you can catch them, you know, whether it's high school or middle school, you've given them a leg up on the workforce, you, you 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 feed them, you equip them, you tell them, you know, here how you do it, you know, here how you have a water cooler conversation. If you meet if you meet your boss in the in the elevator, stop having a conversation about your kid. Have a conversation about the project that you're working on. So is to teach is to teach the young girl the stuff that we're going to teach you at school. Besides, you know, uh, working on different numbers and everything else, but how do you actually navigate the workforce so that you become and effective, and then you have the you have the spotlight, but the right spotlight, so that you can you can progress effectively. Tell me, um, Edvish, what's been one of your greatest life challenges? I would probably say I'm a heart centered leader. So I I I don't only lead based on the uh, what the business need, but I also lead so that everybody that come in contact with me, their life are changed for the best. 
So sometimes the difficulty that I have, and I hope that can help somebody else as well, is I have to step back from the balcony view and look at different situation. What makes sense to help the people that I work with and also what makes sense for the company so that I don't over index on either or. So it is really assessing situation in a more effective way so that you make a balanced approach, you make a balanced decision. And that to me, sometimes it requires me to take a little bit longer to make a decision that is very important. And then for the smaller decision, I can make the quickly, but when something impacts people's lives, I really want to assess everything that is possible so that it, the impact is not so drastic on their life. Um, you speak a lot about, you know, your choice to come here and do what you're doing was for yourself and your family. How is your family today? How have you been able to um, help support and change um, their lifestyles at home? Absolutely. So my, my, all my boys are doing very good. My youngest, I mean, my youngest is 16 and my oldest is 29. And my, tw my 29 is just now became a senior manager. So we're all super happy for him. And my 16 years in 10th grade. So they're all doing very, very good. And uh, William and Wesley. So they're doing really good. My mom lives with us. So my mom that lived with us uh, for the last 10 years, I want her to need for nothing. She had a very difficult childhood. So she lived with us. So she has everything. You know, I don't want to do commercial for Macy's, but she's always at Macy's. So that's one thing. <laughs> And that's one thing. So she's super happy. And my husband also um, works here in the, in the Chicago area. Everybody's doing good. And then we have two dogs. And uh, so my house is a pretty, is a pretty busy, it's a pretty busy house, but we love it. And we really take care of each other. We really uh, have each other kind of like, um, we bounce an idea, we take care of each other, we love each other. Because at the end of the day, when all of this is done, is to really give them a legacy of love. Mm. Mm, that's so beautiful. Um, let's talk about technology. Uh, you know, is there something exciting happening uh, or projects that you're working on at T-Mobile that you can share with us? Well, I can share a specific project about uh, what I'm working on T-Mobile, but in, in the industry in general, we are all, you know, engaged with 5G. And we know that 5G is going to transform the way that we, we, we do uh, medicine, uh, everything related to manufacturing, everything related to uh, automotive cars, even the way that we be even going to heal people in the future. So sport. And so I'm super excited about 5G is, you know, it's no longer the, yes, we still have 4G, but 5G is going to revolutionize the way that we, we experience many, many things. So that is one thing that we're super excited about. I'm super excited about uh, quantum computing. You know, it's going to allow us to improve in terms of security. It's going to allow us to change a different way of uh, managing uh, even the airport, the way that we can manage uh, even the different teams that we have in terms of remote working versus office as a hybrid. So uh, quantum computing is going to be another way of us to change the way that we, we live in our lives. It's going to be very impactful. So those are the cool things that I'm looking at. And obviously, digital transformation. We all have to evolve. We all have to transform mm -hmm. in order for us to sustain and even able to uh, manage costs in terms of providing the best experiences to our customers. So those are three things I'm excited about. And then finally, we will be coming. We will be coming as human along that journey of transformation and digitalization and all that. We will be coming. So it's going to be pretty interesting because we have to evolve whether we want it or not. Yes, I think that's a, that's so important to to teach that. I think to our children as well. But it's harder for older generations with the speed of of things changing and innovation and transformation. Um, what do you say to the people that have concerns about um, AI and its role in all industries? I know that people who don't really work in that field don't understand the benefits? So that's actually a super cool question because imagine, you know, maybe hundred years ago when, when people wanted to have cars and they were telling, okay, we're not gonna have horses no more. We're, gonna, we're not gonna be driving cars to go from point A to point B. People were freaking out. Like, you know, why, you know, why do I need to change? Why you, the concern about what will happen with cars? Now, you know, we, we not even have electric cars. So it's the same thing with AI. AI is just a way for us to utilize the data that we have in order to 
more quickly give us insight so that we can make informed decision. Hmm. So think about it. If you're going to use, you, you, you want to be able to make informed decision quickly and adjust as you go. That's, that's the purpose of AI. So one thing that we could do is first educate ourselves and educate, you know, our teams and everybody around us because people scared, people are scared of something they don't understand. They, you know, they, they run away from things they don't understand. So if we, in the technology realm, we can take the time to teach people about AI, the benefit of AI, and the pros and cons, because anything in life, if you over-index, you're going to have an issue. So it's about balancing everything that we do. And I do believe that it will be tremendous, tremendous impact on uh, the way that we live our life. So AI is here to stay, and I would encourage everybody to... You know, even chat DPT, just go in and you can even ask chat DPT with an AI app. You know, what is AI? It will tell you what AI is and what you could do. You could write different articles. So it's going to be pretty cool. I'm super excited about the future. Yeah. Is there anything as a mother that worries you about technology in the future for your boy? I mean, you have a 29 year old, so he's really a young man, um, but perhaps the, the younger ones. Um, is there anything that you see as negative to perhaps the pull further away from the human element, the human um, input, brain, creativity? To me, as I mentioned earlier, it's about the balance. So as you can imagine, I have four, uh, four young men. Uh, my youngest is 16 and obviously is into games, but we have time. So he can only play game during a certain time. He can only do certain things. It, it doesn't have a Facebook. It doesn't have, you know, there's multiple things that it doesn't have. So I think um, as parents, we have a responsibility in how we want to educate our kid. And then we also have a responsibility in what we want to allow them to have in their life. Because the way that we live our life, whether we want it or not, they are looking at that and learning from us. Like for me, when I get home, I turn off my phone, I turn off different things. So it's... We want to use technology for the benefit that it provides. Mm -hmm. We want to give a kid the guidance that they need because that's why we are the parent. We know the best friend. We are the parents. So it's to give them the guidance that they need and to also share with them the uh, issues or the, you know, if you're over index on, on, on being on a screen all the time or being on TikTok all the time, you know, how, how would that kind of like create some deficiency in the way that you can think? Mm -hmm. So it's to share all those intricacies with a kid and then follow by example what, you know, what we tell them. And I think we can have a better world, but I'm super excited for a kid. I'm, I can imagine when my kids are 50 years old, what car would do. Maybe they will be flying. I have no idea. It's, it's, I think it would be I super cool. So. Yeah, I can't imagine. To tell you the truth, I can't imagine we wouldn't be. I, I just think we're, we're closer to so many things than we think. And there's always something being developed. Um, behind the scenes that we have no idea. And then it just appears one day. Um, tell me if there's somebody, I love this question. If there was one person in the world that you could sit down and have a meal with and have a real deep conversation with, who would that be? Oh, man, a lot of people come to mind. I would probably say Oprah. Um, I, I watch Super Soul Sunday every Sunday at 11 a.m. here, and it has been, I love the way that she think, I love the way that she create an environment where people can come and talk provoking, figure out different things, and it's, and now my whole family actually watch it with me, and I've been, I've been following her for years, you know, so I think if it's, if it's a dream for me, it would be to have a sit down with Oprah, and, uh, have a have coffee. Just talk about just, just talk about life. And I want to turn the table around and ask her question instead of instead of you know you know what yes. is her life you know what has been her life going through you know interviewing thousands of people and trying to change lives and you know being an Oprah show for twenty five years and what is going on. So I really would, that would be cool. But um, yeah. yeah, yeah, she's pretty special. I think she's pretty she's pretty successful and well known. Um, and definitely someone that came from really tough beginnings um, and managed to decide very directly, you know, that she was going to take a different route. Exactly. Yeah. What do you think it is, you know, um, 
women who feel stuck, particularly in industries that have been historically male dominated, if I was to ask you to give them some advice on how to really focus more inward and not, not be concerned with the, the barriers, how would you help them do that? What would you say? I would say three things. The first thing is what we talked about earlier, embrace who you are. Embrace the fact that you are there as a woman, as a you know, foreigner or whoever your background is. You are there for a reason, have the impact. That's the first thing. The second thing, ask for what you need. A lot of people, you know, they, 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 they're hoping that the boss will give them what they need or somebody will get what they need. Nobody can read your mind. So ask for what you need and ask for it, not, you know, not begging, just ask for it clearly. I need for X, Y, and Z, and here's the reason why. And I do believe that it will help me to be successful for the betterment of the business. Period. And then there's a period there, and then you're done. So clearly ask for what you need. And the third thing is have an open mind in life possibility. Nobody wants somebody in the team that's always upset or down or anything else. You want to be the light. You want to be the beacon of hope. You want to be the person in the team that always asking, is there another way? Is there an alternative? You know, stay that optimistic person that open to learning. Because in the world that we are we, uh, we going through, if you're not open to learning, you're gonna get stuck and then you're no longer gonna matter. And then mannerism is very important. So those will be the three things. You know, embrace where you are, embrace your uniqueness. Second, ask for what you need. And then third, be somebody optimistic and have a learning mindset. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. That's a perfect way to end the show, Edvish. Lots of really great um, advice and wisdom from your life story. And I thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Stay tuned, everyone, for a segment with Sherry Morrison. She'll be joined by Jennifer Lynn, award-winning author and journalist. We'll be right back. We are our chop and we can't wait to show you around we're the nation's first children's hospital now a care network with more than 50 locations that continues to expand three state-of-the-art research buildings with 1.5 million square feet of space we have grown from 12 beds 165 years ago to nearly 600 beds and one of the best children's hospitals in the world. We have a level one trauma center, 11 floors of patient units, more than 20 operating rooms, first of its kind delivery unit for babies with birth defects, a separate cardiac operative and catheterization suite, and places to learn, like our internationally recognized simulation center, we have trained generations of leaders in the field of pediatrics. We are world leaders in medicine, surgery, and science. One of the top recipients in NIH funding for pediatric research. In this building, pioneers in CAR T therapy, mitochondrial disease, brain tumors, hyperinsulinism, and other rare diseases. Here, groundbreaking work in fetal surgery, genetics and genomics, and neurology. In our newest building, leaders in social determinants of health, clinical informatics and epidemiology, autism, trauma and injury prevention. Our patients come from every state and 115 countries. challenges requires the best and the brightest. We are passionate about pediatrics. We are motivated to make a difference in the world and in our community. We are a team. We are CHOP. Do you 
you stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. And the big story on Action News. Plus special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amounts of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Welcome to the Lifestyle segment of Women to Watch. I'm Sherry Morrison. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to filmmaker and author, Jennifer Lynn. Welcome to the show, Jennifer. Hi, Sherry. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Jennifer, you were born and raised in the Philadelphia area. You studied journalism at Duquesne University and then are ma- now married with two grown children. You were a journalist for the Philadelphia Inquirer for 31 years with postings as a financial correspondent for Wall Wall Street, a national correspondent in Washington, and an international correspondent in Beijing. You stepped away from the Inquirer in 2015 with the intention of exploring a new way because you wanted to tell stories in film and words. I love that. You've completed two books, a documentary, and are currently working on two documentaries, if you would please touch briefly on the two projects you are most proud of finishing after leaving the Inquirer, your book, Shanghai Faithful, a family memoir you started in 1975, uh, 1979, I'm sorry, and the production of the documentary Beethoven in Beijing, which you started filming in 2016. Tell us a little bit about them. Yeah, well, thank you, Sherry. Um, you're right. I left the paper in 2015 because I wanted to try new types of storytelling. And my father is an immigrant from Shanghai. And in 1979, when I was still in college, he took us to China to meet his family that he left behind. And that really planted the seed. I mean, I I just became, over the years, just really focused on finding out my family history. Um, I I worked at the Inquirer. I was able to do many magazine stories about my family in China because I traveled often to China and I was based there for a few years in the 1990s. And, you know, after accumulating so much information and research, I decided to write a family memoir. And Shanghai Faithful, I look at five generations of my father's family in China. And what makes them interesting and unique is uh, they were Christians. So what I did is I went back basically to the first convert who was a fisherman in the province of Fujian. And through the story of my family over 150 years, you really get to know the history of modern China, but through a story uh, about the characters in my family. Uh, My grandfather was an Episcopal minister. He actually spent two years studying at the University of Pennsylvania. And so uh, I was able to publish Shanghai Faithful in 2017. And then my other big project uh, was the documentary Beethoven in Beijing. And, you know, it was the very day that I left the Inquirer that I went to the orchestra and I pitched to them the idea of doing this movie because the Philadelphia Orchestra has this tremendous legacy in China. They were the first American orchestra to perform in China. And I really felt that this was a story about the United States and China that not many people knew. And I felt like this was a story that really should be seen and heard, not just read about. So... I asked them about making a movie and and they agreed. Um, I ended up partnering with Sam Katz, who has a company in Philadelphia called History Making Productions. And Sam and I spent five years putting together Beethoven in Beijing. And we uh, premiered it in in 2020. It was a virtual premiere. We had expected to show it at the Academy of Music, but we all know what was happening in 2020. So we, we had a virtual premiere, but I was really, you know, thrilled with that and it's it's a movie that continues to attract uh audiences that's fantastic and i think um it also premiered in 2020 and that was beethoven's 250th birthday anniversary isn't it it was yeah and i forgot to mention it was on pbs's great performances so it got a national broadcast which was thrilling yeah and you had some great write-ups after that I think it's interesting you wrote the book after you produced the film. It usually works the other way around. Uh, And I understand with any information gathering project, even with this little program, and and you you covered so much more, there's a lot of information that gets filtered out that I think is still really interesting and relevant. Is that why you decided to write the book? 
So the book was actually my COVID project. Uh, like all of us, I was kind of stuck in my office <laughs> and uh, I uh, decided to mine my research and to write an oral history. I had so much research that I had done for the movie that didn't make the movie. So I did additional interviews, collected more information and, and published through Temple University an oral history of the Philadelphia Orchestra's uh, tour of China in 1973. The orchestra shared with me their archival uh, photos. So there are a hundred photos in, in the book. And that came out in, in uh, last year, actually, this time last year. Hmm. And this is kind of an off the, off the direct topic. I know Eugene Ormandy was one of Nixon's favorite conductors and that's sort of how the story came about with Philadelphia Orchestra going to Beijing. Do you know if his daughters, Patricia or Julia, or Julia have seen the documentary? You know, I don't know, but we did have a screening of the movie at the Nixon Library in, in oh, California. Wow. So hopefully they've seen it. That would be fantastic. So moving on, let's talk about one of your new projects, Beyond Yellow Face. It seems timely as it shines a light on the persistence of anti-Asian stereotypes in ballet and explores current advocacy work to make ballet more inclusive. Please tell us what inspired you to create Beyond Yellow Face. Sure. Actually, um, it was an idea that my daughter brought to me, uh, Corey Steig. She was a, a dancer, a very serious ballet dancer when she was growing up. And she shared with me this book called uh, Final Bow for Yellow Face by a, a dancer in New York named Phil Chan. So Beyond Yellow Face really looks at Phil Chan and Gina Paskogin and their advocacy in trying to eliminate racial stereotypes from ballets. They've had an incredible impact in the world of ballet. They have created a space for a conversation about how people of different cultures are represented in ballets, some of which date back like 100, 150 years. So the film will look at Gina and Phil and the work that they are doing to kind of bring attention to the issue of representation in the arts. So that's in production right now. And, and I'm very excited about that. Um, you know, I love the world of ballet and this is not about cancel culture. It's about making culture, classical culture more expansive really. So that, that hopefully will come out sometime next year. Well, I can't wait. And from what I understand, 10 times better, your even newer project emerged from your work on Beyond Yellow Face when you discovered George and his story became so, you became somewhat obsessed with finding George and learning more. Um, you sent me a little clip of what you've done so far and the only problem with the clip was it ended and I can't wait to see the whole story and everything you've put together. Please tell us a little bit about the incredible and, and almost secretive life of George. I love this story, Sherry. Um, you know, I've spent 40 years as a reporter and the story of George Lee is really one of the most compelling that I've ever come across. I was doing research on the Nutcracker uh, because Phil and Gina, a lot of their advocacy focuses on the Nutcracker and how kind of you portray Chinese uh, dancers in that. And I was in the library in New York and I saw a photo of the first dancer who did the Nutcracker for George Balanchine in 1954. And it was a Chinese dancer. And I thought, you know, wow, he must have had an incredible career with the New York City Ballet, but he never danced for them. And he didn't dance for anyone, any of the big ballet companies. And I became obsessed with finding George and I found him. And he's an 88 year old blackjack dealer in Las Vegas. And I, I went out there once to film him. We're returning in a month. And I was able to ask George, George, you know, you were a phenomenon in 1954. You had just come here as a refugee from Shanghai in 1951, you were 18 years old. Why didn't you dance for the New York City Ballet? And he said, oh, they told me I was too short. But there's a happy ending to this because Gene Kelly, the famous Gene Kelly, uh, was directing Flower Drum Song. And he cast George in the original cast of Flower Drum Song. And so George went on to have a very uh, full and successful career as a Broadway dancer. But really, you know, the George story is a story about an immigrant, a refugee from China who came here and through perseverance and grit 
really made a life for himself and was a, a real success. I mean, he, he was the first Asian to dance with the New York City Ballet. Oh, it is. It's such a wonderful story. And I understand how you became so obsessed with this amazing piece of ballet and, and dance history. I mean, I can't imagine Gene Kelly like saying to, to me, because I was such a big fan of his, I, mean, I, I love Broadway and musicals. I can't imagine him like bringing George into that uh, light and and making him a part of so many famous shows. It's It's a great story. So what's next? Um, finishing your projects? Do you have anything new on the horizon? Well, I, I hope to finish the George story 10 times better this year and hopefully bring that out to the world next year. And then we're also working on finishing up Beyond Yellow Face. And uh, that, that will be a longer project because it's a full documentary and George is the 10 times better story is only a short documentary. So I'll be busy in the editing room, Jerry, for, for the next few months. Well, that's great. And and just so people understand, 10 Times Better, I think, came from his mother, who was a ballet dancer, very famous, um, over in China and Russia and, and maybe Poland. And she told George when he started dancing that if he wanted to amount to anything, he had to be 10 times better. So what a great, what a great thing for your mother to instill in you. Yeah. And the reason was they were refugees from China. And so she told him, you're going into a white world. And you must be ten times better. Yeah. And he that embedded in his in his um, mind. Wow. Smart, smart, smart. So you do speaking engagements, and I see you're going to be interviewed this coming weekend, the 26th at 3 p.m. by David O'Reilly after a screening of Beethoven in Beijing in Wellsboro, Pennsylvania. And on April 4th, you'll be speaking at the Philadelphia City Institute branch of Free Library on Rittenhouse Square. Do you have any other big engagements coming up? I do, um, one at the University of North Carolina and also at Hong Kong University, they've invited us out there. The nice thing about Beethoven in Beijing is there is real international appeal as well as interest in the story beyond just Philadelphia. So those are two on the calendar so far. Um, so join me in Hong Kong. <laughs> I, I would love to. <laughs> Well, we are out of time. Thank you so much for your time and putting all of this amazing history together. What an interesting career path you've had. And you've kind of pivoted a little bit, but continued with what you're, with what you're good at. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sherry. I enjoyed the conversation. Sure. If you're interested in purchasing either of Jennifer Lynn's books, they are available on Amazon. If you have any questions for Jennifer, you may contact her by email at Jennifer Lynn. 1100 at yahoo.com and her last name Lynn is spelled L-I-N or you may google either of the two documentaries which are still works in progress to see if there are any upcoming screenings. Thank you again. Sue will be right back to close out the show. Ladies, keep living your dreams. It's the number one news at 10 p.m. Action news on PHL 17. Join Shari Williams, Gray Hall, Deuces Rogers, and meteorologist Adam Joseph for all the big stories at a time that's right for you. Action news at 10 p.m. on PHL 17. Hi, this is Sue Rocco. Women to Watch is pleased to share a clip from Breaking Through, a podcast hosted by Madeline Bell, the president and CEO of Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. This interview is part of a series in which Madeline interviews CHOP's women scientists about what inspires them and advice they have for other women interested in pursuing science and medicine careers. My guest today is Dr. Susan Firth. In 2021, Dr. Firth was named CHOP's chief scientific officer. She is the first woman in CHOP's 166-year history to hold this important role. I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Firth to Breaking Through. So, Sue, it's really great to be talking with you today, and it's a topic that I'm very interested in, which is the future of CHOP and science and research and discoveries. But let me say that you are now our chief scientific officer, so how exciting from that girl with the chemistry set yeah. to the woman who is now the leader of our scientific community here at CHOP. And tell me, you've been in the role now for about six months, and tell me a little bit about what your impressions are, what excites you about the role, and what do you see for the next several years? 
It's a really exciting place to be and an exciting time in science. Since I've been at CHOP now for about 11 years, and with the talent that we have here, our sense of mission with research as our North Star, I think we have the opportunity to transform the medical care we deliver to children. To hear more of Madeline's interviews with CHOP's amazing doctors and scientists, listen to Breaking Through with Madeline Bell, available wherever you get your podcasts. That's it, everyone, for another week of Women to Watch. Thanks so much for tuning in. Um, Stay tuned for my interview next week with Heidi Messer. Heidi is the founder of uh, a tech company called Collective Eye. Um, Excuse me. She's an award winner in the technology and entrepreneurship arena, um, has a patent, and um, she's just an absolute dynamo. Thanks as always to our producer, Katiri, and all of our sponsors for helping us to bring you the show each week. Have a great week, everyone. Now, the Women to Watch, Military Watch. Fewer than half of eligible veterans use the VA health benefits they are entitled to. But those who do use the VA, more than 80% of veterans are satisfied with the VA care. Hi, I'm Carol Eggert, Senior Vice President of Military Affairs at Comcast NBC Universal. Now, you may be asking, why should this matter to me? I share this with you because most of our listeners have some connection to the veterans in their community and may have the opportunity to share information about this new VA benefit. The VA has just launched the PACT Act, which is the Promise to Address Comprehensive Toxics, which is the most significant expansion of veteran benefits and care in more than three decades empowering the VA to help millions of toxic exposed veterans and their survivors. The PACT Act expands VA health care and benefits for veterans exposed to burn pits, Agent Orange, and many other toxic substances. The PACT Act adds to the list of health conditions that the VA presumes are caused by exposure to these substances. This law helps the VA provide generations of veterans and their survivors with the care and benefits they've earned and deserve. The PACT Act is the least we can do for the countless men and women who suffered toxic exposure while serving their country, said President Biden during the PACT Act bill signing ceremony. It means access to life insurance, home loan insurance, tuition benefits, and help with health care. So what can you do? Simply refer those veterans you know to va.gov and tell them to search the PACT Act to learn more.